Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Downtime in the Apocalypse, a podcast where Ted talks and Kevin listens. I am Ted. And I am Kevin. <laughs> and I'm listening right now. That's why I responded so quickly. Yes, 100% listening. Yes. Uh, he has, <laughs> I have his undivided attention whatsoever. Now, clearly I don't, but I'm going to forgive him. I mean, the world is ending. We are all isolated social distancing um i do believe i heard that yellowstone was erupting the zombies have finally awakened and we are both settled down in our respective safety rooms in our basements that we hastily constructed over the last nine months i i i would say mine is mostly made out of cardboard at this point so i hope it holds up yeah well honestly about 75% of my supplies are by old family stockpile, I guess would be the better term, of moonshine. And my father's collection of Miller High Life that when I finally got him off it and got him onto Guinness and Good Cider, he gave to me for some reason. I don't know why he gave it to me. I've always hated him. Well, I mean... I, it, it's good for now it, to have a stockpile about anything. I don't think there's a bad stockpile to have personally in an, in an apocalypse. I cannot think of like a bad stockpile. Uh, that is true, especially because I think it's just under the alcohol content that's dehydrating. So it's still slightly hydrating, like the old sailor beer stuff when they had to go across the sea and had to put lime in it so they don't get scurvy. Oh, uh, speaking of lime. Uh, one thing that we want to try and talk about during the apocalypse is hydration. So, a big aspect of that is trying out new drinks that you can try during the apocalypse. Um, and one of those drinks, for me at least, is ghost pepper tequila, called Ghost, fittingly. Um, it's something me and Ted have tried, and are trying. Um, one second. Mm. Still good. It's a mixture of soda water, lime, and a bottle of ghost tequila that I almost bash a zombie's brain in with. Yeah, Kevin. Uh, for one thing, that'd be a waste of a perfectly good sanitizer in case they bite you. But it's not a bad drink, all things together. I thought it would be spicier, to be perfectly honest. I think the I think the lime really helps out. Just kind of numbs the spiciness just a little bit. Yeah, and I I feel like. Lime does numb the spice, but also I feel like the flavor of neutralized spice with lime is very good in its own right. Yeah, that's why it's on like 90% of spicy dishes, a little bit of like lime juice, and yeah, that's it makes like a great mix. I love it so much. Yeah, uh, this is weird, Kevin. I never thought of you as a spicy person up to this point. Oh no, I've, I've always loved the spice. In fact, uh... But the only time I haven't liked the spice is when I had uh, nuclear wings in um, Maine, now called New Maine, due to the zombie apocalypse. Um, during that time, I had those nuclear wings. I went to the bathroom and rubbed my tongue with a paper towel to get the taste out of my mouth. And my family has never let me live it down since. I mean, given your family, that doesn't surprise me in any way, shape, or form. They're not the type of person to... Ever, ever, ever let a joke slide. No, no, they are not. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, yeah, my stockpile this week is not nearly that interesting. I've been drinking Irish ginger ale. It is the brand called Irish ginger ale? Yeah, it says that on the bottle. Uh, not the, uh, yeah, bottle. It's a plastic bottle. I've also got it in can form. It's not bad at all. It's a little bit less sweet than most ginger ales, um, which I enjoy. I don't normally mind sweet, but I also am a big fan of ginger beer, so I think the lack of sweetness just reminds me of that just a little bit more. Right. Uh, also, interestingly enough, it's caffeinated, which I've never seen in any sort of ginger ale before. Oh, really? Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Something I learned when I was, you know, having a bit of a sore stomach and decided to have one at three in the morning when I woke up from bed 
and suddenly I was like, man, I have a lot of energy. Well, I told you not to eat that like mangy dog, so I'm glad the ginger ale helped with that. Kevin, you're the one who literally expressly told me to eat anything that looks like a French bulldog. Now, a lot of things look like a French bulldog. Pigs look like French bulldogs. Some spiders look like French bulldogs. There's a lot of things that look like French bulldogs that I also don't like. I mean, up until a few months ago when the radiation hit, I would have said that. I've never seen a spider that looks like a French bulldog. But nowadays, um, spider Frenchies are fairly common. And I mean, generally, I'm surprised we haven't started uh, farming these things. Honestly, the silk is just excellent quality. They're shockingly friendly. I'm still surprised that somehow they've evolved to eat wheatgrass primarily. They're like the best hipsters ever. I, I say there's, like, one irredeemable quality about those, and do you know what that is? They're spiders? No, they have French Bulldog in them. And also spiders. So, actually, two irredeemable qualities. I will never understand your hatred of spiders. I mean, nowadays, they keep malaria down just because of their webs and eating mosquitoes. Ted, I, I think, like, before the, before the pandemic, 90% of the world would agree with me that spiders are, you know, just terrible. <laughs> but now that the apocalypse has happened, I think I still have like a solid 60%. Hmm. Well, I hope those people cut malaria blankets because it's going to be a rough one. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's fair enough. All right. So now that we've gotten our hydration out of the way during the apocalypse, let's go over our weeks during the apocalypse here. Um, Ted, do you want to go first since I went first with the ghost pepper tequila? I mean, what do you want to say? I've been going through through the normal 3 to 11 grind that I do, um, which, weirdly enough, even before the apocalypse, I was still under non-disclosure agreement to talk about most of the time. I can say, I, say it involves a bunch of children, and it's hard, but uh, I don't think you want us talking about the day jobs and fantasize the days before. I believe you want me to talk about the things that I've done to uh, more or less entertain myself in this bunker. Yes, uh, one of the most pressing matters of, uh, I would say, any apocalypse, or even for the apocalypse, is not going insane. So right now, uh, we're just going to be going over mainly things that we've been doing to keep ourselves busy and occupied, other than just surviving. So, and I count work as survival, so farming the potato fields and such. Uh, but what have you been doing to relax and uh, take your mind off the dread and terribleness of the apocalypse? So actually, I have been doing a small amount of farming. I'm going, I'm going out and picking the last of the lemon bomb leaves uh, that have sprouted. I've always had a decent uh, patch of it around here, and somehow it hasn't died despite both the weather and the nuclear fallout. I know that's really surprising. Yeah, uh, but besides that, it's been a lot of audiobooks, and I've been going through the Dresden Files series very quickly. Um, a friend of mine tried to get me to read them back in college, gave me the books and everything. I couldn't stand them. But honestly, now a friend of mine, a different friend of mine, gave me the audiobook versions, and I've been listening to these things for like six hours a day, every day. <laughs> That's like a huge turnaround from I hate these to six hours a day. I... So I think it has something to do with the narrator and just being told, like, look, you have to get through the first two books. Right. And like, and I believe the author said that himself, right? Yeah, that was part of the intro to the third book, which I must admit, I it's it, kind of an interesting thing hearing from an author where he's like, yeah, a lot of people think this is where the stories, uh, series really starts. And to a certain extent, I have to agree with them. It's like, Okay, man, I, I can respect that. Could you imagine if, like, J.K. Rowling said, like, yeah, ignore, like, the first two books. The, those suck. Sorcerer's Stone, uh, whatever, blah, I hate it. Um, the third one, uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, now that's where you want to really, that's where the book takes off. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, that would be so weird for a lot of reasons. So he didn't say skip those two, I mean. Right, so you still need a narrative for that. I Yeah. So it's pulpy enough, and he does go over enough that I feel like you probably could start with the book if you want to. Yeah. I wouldn't so, suggest it, but I mean, you could. I mean, 
you'd be very confused how he has a pack of college werewolves following him around occasionally. When when you say college werewolves, you mean what do you mean by that, Ted? Uh, werewolves in college. Okay, so a very literal kind of term. I wasn't sure that was like uh, soon to be full werewolves or just werewolves that are in college. <laughs> they haven't got their werewolf diploma yet. Yeah, they're still they're still like fresh. <laughs> Still freshman werewolf. Uh, no, they're sophomore werewolves. Soft idiots. Uh, do you remember that from like uh, college? Yeah, I, I. It took me forever to find out what that's what it meant. Oh God, I love that so much. It, it's like that's the only one that's like insulting. Really, is sophomore for some reason. Yeah, it it, it literally means wise moron, right? Or yeah, just like wise idiot or something similar to that. Yeah, yeah, they, um. I found that in philosophy class where a professor described my ar argument as sophomoric. <laughs> okay, man. Um, you didn't answer my question, though. Is, is, was that the professor who didn't believe the world existed, or am I thinking of a different one? Oh, I never had him. I went to one of his lectures, and uh, I asked him one question. Then he takes a red pen out, Puts it in front of my face, waves it around a bit, and says, what do you see? And I say, oh, it's a red pen. And he goes, really? Are you sure? Out of everything in your sensory experience, you pick those. And I cannot tell you what the middle part of the conversation was. It went about 20 minutes, but it ended with, and that's why 9-11 happened. Wait, what? <laughs> And honestly, if I knew that's how it was going to end, I would have listened far more intently. Uh, okay, uh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. I, I, I wish that was a joke. I don't know <laughs> the reasoning, and I will never know. That man is now dead, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but oh. I will... I will never... I, I tried asking a few people around me, it's like, what happened? And, I mean, the people at fall, there was one guy who just loved this sort of crap, and, like, he would... Right. He could have made popcorn, I'm sure he would have. Yeah, um, yeah. But he couldn't fully explain it in any way, shape, or form, so I will never... I mean, I, I know even if I heard it and tried to study it, I never would have understood the argument, but I'll just never even know how he got there. Right, like the steps, like here within, to get to that statement, I suppose. Okay. Right. Yeah. I. Oh. Uh, okay. Okay. Um. <laughs> anything else that week? Uh, that's kind of a uh, that has been helping you stave off boredom, other than the Dresden Files, my friend. Uh, yes, teaching uh, twelve to fifteen year old teenage boys how to play three point five Dungeons and Dragons. Ah, okay. Is this uh, is this teaching more? I would say, like, is it therapeutic in a way, or is it just kind of like fun to see someone try to learn like a system? Oh, it more or less for my amusement. Okay, so it's more sadistic than than beneficial, I guess. Oh, well, you know, to an extent, yes. I'm actually annoyed how well they did making characters. Oh, okay. Look, three point they. They they are used to the fifth edition model, and that's very user friendly. Yeah. And so these kids they go to a boarding school, and they're allowed maybe one hour of computer time on weekdays, not on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And they don't have access to any books, but they've been using that time to like print out bits of the players' handbooks, like making little think tank groups. Yeah. Like, I've been doing my best not to help them, honestly. I've probably been purposely advising them against some of the good stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, more or less because I want interesting things. So when they're talking about cool fighter builds, I'm like, yeah, but did you know a soul knife exists that you can make a sword with your mind? <laughs> Is it good? No. no. And it, it's awful, actually. Oh. Um, <laughs> um but even then, yeah, I'll tell them it's awful, and they'll just get the idea in their mind and start looking at it. And now I so, got a skull knife in the party. So, are, are, would you say like you're the Pied Piper of uh, useless builds? Oh, absolutely! I love useless builds, and I'm still annoyed that so many of them did so well making characters. 
Right, okay. Like, even the Soul Life guy was like, oh, well, I'll pick this, I'll go to a different book and find this, uh, and be a scar in it. All right, looks like this character really can't turn on to level three where it can get multi-attack and everything. Right. So I'll use this build in this place, this kind of be a fighter. I'm like, why are you thinking so well? <laughs> uh, seriously, I had no one make stupid characters that were just unforgivably bad. Right. Um, they took beats really well. All their species were picked. I have a uh, picked with skill. I have a bunch of Warforge in the party. Um, well, all... Warforge are just cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, they took as a joke, but also, like, you can get some of the best arm in the game at level one as a Warforge if you do it right. And both of them are like, this is amazing. I have like an 18 AC and damage reduction at level one. I'm like, yeah, kids, you picked really well. The only thing they all universally messed up on was skills. Okay. And honestly, I mean, they don't know that tumbles the of like a necessity in that edition. Okay, right. So they just they just missed out on some of those things specifically, like very useful skills. Like, what what was the worst one you would say they picked? Oh, um. Okay, so this is one thing that I thought was interesting. They near universally a bunch of their ranks into crafting skills. Oh, okay. And does 3.5 just, like, have nothing in crafting? I mean, you can craft. I mean, it, it's not a bad thing to do in downtime in our low-money campaign. Right. But, I mean, there's no reason for 75% of the party to be proficient blacksmiths. <laughs> <laughs> I Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, it might not be idea to have one blacksmith in case they roll a one or something in their uh, weapon or armor breaks and these can repair, but not everyone needs to know how to make these things. I mean, that's that's a fair and true statement. I'll agree with that. Yeah, and now this is one of those things where I'm like, wow, why did no one take a single rank and, like, hide or move silently? <laughs> I... Oh man, I it's 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 like interesting, kind of going back and uh, especially with you, since you know all of these like systems uh, for I would say ninety percent of uh, role playing games. Would would that be a safe estimate? Oh no, there, I haven't heard of ninety percent of them. But ninety, if any, if you've seen it in a game store, there is a ninety percent chance I have played it. Okay, yeah, that's that's a like, more that's a better way to say it. Uh, yeah, unfortunately now, I mean, I can't say unfortunately, with the kind of rise of the internet and the drive through RPG error and PDFs, yeah. there's, no, there's no way I'm, I can play all of them. I mean, dear Lord, if you ever want just a plethora of good RPGs, a bunch of people make a hundred word or less ones every year. Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's basically like a never-ending creativity flow right there, basically, right? Yeah, God, so many of them are just gems. Yeah, I can't wait. That's uh, that's something else we're gonna be looking forward to uh, during the apocalypse. Is nice little role playing games. But yeah. before we uh, get on to anything else, there, let me go over my week if you don't mind, Ted. Oh, not at all, Kevin. One second. Let me sit back with my cup of lukewarm instant coffee. <laughs> Got um, everyone stock up on coffee. You never know how much you'll miss it till. Well, until you can't go to a Dunkin' Donuts without seeing a zombie. Uh, America runs away from the zombies. Yeah, uh, I was kind of excited for the Starbucks Dunkin' Donuts war, but uh, overall, kind of disappointing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a regional thing. I mean, we are kind of in the Dunkin' Donuts um, stronghold in Massachusetts. I heard it was a... I think they changed the name to Empire. Dunkin' Donuts Empire? Uh, that would explain it. I mean, long live the princeps, but still. Yeah, Princess Dunks, yeah. Well, okay, so uh, this, uh, this like, past week, um, I've been doing mostly uh, one one thing in particular, and that's playing a game on Steam, or Steam, and that game is called Lisa the Painful. Have you heard of this game, Ted? I have played Lisa, actually. Yes, okay, so I have... Uh, I have not played Lisa before. I bought it like years ago, around when Undertale was really like popping off. Yeah, same. Um, there was a 
YouTube channel called Extra Credits, and it was in games you might not have tried, and they mentioned Lisa as the anti-Undertale. Yeah, that's... Okay. I, I want to talk about uh, that just a little bit. So, in case you guys don't know, um, Und uh, Undertale is a, uh, I would say, Earthbound-esque type game. Would you say that's accurate, Ted? Yes, to the 7% of the audience who have not heard of and probably played Undertale. Yeah, and then uh lisa uh it, i would say is similar in certain aspects but radically different in many aspects yeah uh i mean undertale can bring you to highs and lows of emotion sadness yeah. and laughter and sorrow and all that jazz lisa does not do that it is a one-way trip down yeah to he double hockey six as they say yeah Ugh, Kevin, I'm not gonna lie, I couldn't beat Lisa. That game is hard as hell. I, okay, so I, I've been going through it. Uh, I haven't completed it yet. I'm uh, probably next time we talk, I, I will. I think I'm getting pretty close. Um, and then I still have to play the joyful. I've uh, only played the painful so far. Um, my biggest experience with the game is uh, I haven't played something where the narrative hates you as a person. Like, it, the, that's the easiest way for me to describe this kind of game. It's, uh, you remember when um, you climb up that like long rope all the way to the top of the mountain? How could I forget? Yeah, so you spend like, I don't know, even know how long it is, but uh, you just like go up there. It's reminiscent of like uh, Metal Gear Solid when you're climbing the ladder um, and you just get up all the way to the top and it's a giant middle finger just like pointing right at your face. Yeah, that, that, that. That, uh, man, that is a rough game in, like, seven different ways. It's a really rough game. It's, I, the thing is, though, I love it. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I, it, it's, it's like a, it, it's like it's challenging you to uh, keep on playing it in some aspects. It's just like the, uh, the combat is, the combat's uh, actually fun. I like it a lot. Um it the the way it kind of works is that you have uh, different type sets of characters and they have like different skill sets. Um, your main character, uh, Brad, um, he has like Armstrong style where you put in like different uh, inputs to the uh, keyboard and then you have different like skills that you play with. Um, generally, all of those are pretty fun, uh, but uh, <laughs> the decisions you make in this game just make you uh, kind of hate yourself all the time. Yeah, there is, I mean, really, this it's sort of a life lesson. There are no wins or losses in life. There's only trade-offs. Yeah, it's it's like how, it's like you could be slightly worse off, or you could be, like, really bad off. Yeah, uh, and even then, it's like, well, is it you that suffers? And in what way? And how much will you, you know, put on the people around you? And uh, there, there's, yeah, there's no winning that game mentally. I mean, there's a probably an end screen. Once again, I've never actually seen it. I don't ever plan on playing it fully. Yeah. I, I mean, once I played that, I played it for a little bit, and then I also had Mini Metro, and I much prefer that. Okay. Uh, what's a Mini uh, Mini Metro? Okay, absolute minimalist game. Yeah. Um, has nothing to do with Lisa. I just happened to get them at the same time. Right. Um, but you. Very minimalistic, and I want to put out like drawing the lines. Uh, have to make the metro systems for different cities around the world, and see how long you can get them to run before there's just a um, overwhelming in like a station or two. Okay, and it's like it's very like uh, simplified. Like for example, instead of like having the stations be like, oh, this is a work center or anything, they're just shapes. Okay. It's a square, a circular triangle, and then as as it gets up and your city expands, uh, more and more of them will appear, and at the stations, passengers will appear, which are also the shapes, and that tells you what shape uh, what shape uh, of station they need to. Triangles need to go triangles, and you just need to make paths that will quickly bring them around and to their destination. It has nice sound effects. It's very relaxing. You can spend 20 minutes or 20 hours doing it. Like, it's one of those games where you know what the game is very quickly. And right. 
people just enjoy it. But you are limited in resources. You can redo them at any time um, for minimal cost. Um, the only cost being that it will be gone for a moment while they uh, are redrawn. But you can redo it any time, but you know, there might be a river and you can only have so many bridges. Or like you can only have so many lines in a railroad. So you can have the red, the blue, and the yellow. And once you do it for enough day cycles, you can another one. But it's never quite Right. Okay. I see what you're saying. It's uh, I I always kind of find that stuff interesting as well. Just sort of like uh, I guess it's a a management sim. I would say is that like uh accurate? Yeah, but uh, in like it's closer to Atari Breakout in complexity than Factorio. Okay. That yeah. No, that's that's fair. <laughs> like it's it's a management sim, but it is so abstracted the point where it's nothing similar to like actually running a metro system other than just fully understanding how there is no winning designing trains <laughs> <laughs> like I, 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 it made, so i'm from massachusetts it was kevin and yeah. it gave me great sympathy for the people that had to design the t the metro system in boston because Man, there is just no way to optimally design that in a satisfactory way. Right, uh, like you will always be unhappy. Yeah, like, yeah, it's just minimizing the unhappiness. Yeah. But, like you don't win in, in that industry. It's like being part of the uh, your lost luggage. You, you don't have a good day. Isn't that like a, I mean, Speaking of the apocalypse, that's sort of just in general what we're trying to do is just minimize the unhappiness that we feel, I guess. I mean, yes, Kevin. So I must admit, um, so Kevin, I mean, we have got our solar farm to get enough electricity. Yeah. Um, and you managed to, in one of your scavenging missions, find a couple copies of an old VHS, which I thought was interesting. Oh, yes. Uh, so, we managed to track down something that uh, I have seen many, many times uh, pre-apocalypse and now a couple times post. Well, I guess it's present? I don't know. Either way. Um, right now, uh, we have watched The Addams Family, the one from 1991, one of my favorite films. Yeah, okay. So, for the audience, I have watch a ridiculously small amount of movies in my life. I don't know how it happened. I just turned 28, and besides seeing most of the movies on Mystery Science Theater 3000, yep. I have not seen, like, any movie that you think would be a classic or an important movie to watch besides the most bare basics. I've seen Star Wars, for instance, Jurassic Park. It's hard to be a, you know, Right, but you haven't seen things like Jaws. Yeah, I've not seen Jaws. I tried watching it once. Um, I rented it from a blockbuster with my cousin, but we accidentally got the version with director's commentary. Oh. <laughs> and okay. We, tr we tried watching it. We like we did, um, but it was not exactly interesting for anyone who has not seen the movie. Right, and as as I would say, for most things with uh, uh, director's document, yeah, yeah, okay. And, uh, with the exception of maybe Futurama, if I get to watch the Futurama with the commentary, it's very funny. Um, oh no, I can imagine. But yeah, that, I have not seen Jaws, and nor have I seen any Adams Family media whatsoever up until this point. Yes, uh, so we watched it to we watched it together. Um, I I enjoyed uh, several of your reactions, uh, namely um, in the beginning which I really think sets the mood for the whole entire film. Uh, Ted, if you want to describe that uh, opening scene. Yeah, um, it's kind of burned in my brain. I mean, my first note on this movie was, oh, the Adams Family movie is a Christmas movie because there are carolers just going around to the Adams Family mansion. Yeah. And as they're singing, you see the family up on the roof with a cauldron of, I'm assuming to be boiling oil. Yep. And they just dump it on the carolers. Now yeah. we don't we don't see the carolers with their scalded bodies or anything, but we also like we just don't know if any of them took some life-sustaining injuries. Like it was very a casual 
potential murder to start off the movie with. Yeah, and I mean, um, yeah, uh, I, I kind of blame the carolers just a little bit. And, and here's, here's why, Ted. I, I blame them just a little bit because if you live in that town or live anywhere near that town, I would assume you know who the Adams family is. Yeah, uh, it would be, you know, I did not think of that, Kevin, but yeah. That'd be, I, that'd be like I, going to like Carol at like Mr. Burns' mansion and not expecting him to release the hounds. Yeah, they're, yeah, I, actually, e even if they didn't, I feel like at some point they'd have to interact with someone in that town and they would get a warning about that. I feel like that has to be when the first thing comes up. You know what's interesting too is that uh, the the gate is alive on the Adams family residence. So, yes. um, so I mean, the, the gate yeah. was in on it. He must have been. I mean, he knew what they were planning, and he let them in. So I guess like the Adams family really wanted to pour oil on carolers. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, <laughs> there is just like several very casual murders in. There. Yes. Uh. Like, so. Yes, as 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 we go through that, um, the there are several uh, very casual murders uh, right after the Carolers. What's the what's the next murder right after that? Uh, uh oof, I don't even remember. Um, one second, let me check my notes. Uh, do you remember, Kevin? I think it might have been Pugsley with like the uh, bus sign. I think. Oh God, yeah, that was a ways away, but yeah, um, uh, yeah, it was very just. He just cuts, like, a stop sign or something, and everyone just listens and just waits to hear a car crash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it is very strange how, like, I don't know, I feel like he would have been arrested by now. I, I feel that as well. Um, yeah, possibly. Um, what one one thing as well, uh, I I love about the uh, the movie itself is it's very like it looks very Tim Burtony. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was Tim Burtony before it was Tim Burton. I mean, yeah. Like, did you know the uh, the original director they wanted to get for the film was actually Tim Burton? Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, and he turned it down, and then it was Barry Sodenfeld, who went on to make such things as. Men in Black, Men in Black 2. Um, also, I believe uh, one of the most recent films that he uh, directed was uh, Nine Lives, starring Kevin Spacey. Ooh, that is... Um... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just a little that... trivia. Yeah, that is interesting. So, anyways, as much as this movie had a plot... Um... It was mostly about them discovering their, uh, I don't know who to talk to. It's about the Adams family in general. They're strange, 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 um, one second, Kevin, uh, I need to, uh, get my thoughts here and make sure I'm actually getting all their names right, because Okay, uh, if, some... if, if you have any mistakes, I'll try to correct them. I know this movie like the back of my very wrinkly hands. Kevin, how many times have you seen this movie? Um... I think like at least like thirty times. Now, was this just like one of your favorite kid movies? Um, well, I just love the scene where they uh, pour boiling oil on the carolers. Okay, so it's about <laughs> it starts with Gomez Adams. That's his name, right? Um, uh, yes, Mister Gomez Adams, the father uh, of the household, played by Raúl Julius, I believe. I'll take your word on that one, Kevin. Yeah. Um, uh, if that's the actor's name, he does a great job. Um, oh, he's, but, he's awesome. But yeah, it's about him trying to find his brother, who he seems to think is dead. Yeah, they're like, they're, to... they're trying to do, like, a seance. Right. Um, now, it turns out I was, this, the, they had a fight over a woman, oh, sort of. Um, sort of, sort of. Women's, um, over a conjoined twin of a woman who... Um, his brother Fester, yeah, um, played by Christopher Lloyd, uh, was in love with. I at this point one hundred percent thought Gomez killed him. Well, I mean, 
the uh, the mention of uh, mm-hmm. casual murder of his mother and several other people is uh, thrown in there, so I could see why you think that, or, well, or thought that. It's mostly because it's a seance. Like, oh, okay, that too. If he's just missing, I mean, I guess it's the Adams family, but the same, and you know, they they think of death a lot, but at the same time, have they tried looking like properly? Well, it was also like twenty five years is like a, a number they bring up a lot. So yeah, he hasn't, I, yeah, hasn't seen him for like twenty five years, like zero contact during that whole entire time. Yeah, but they do the uh, seance every year, and they said they do it on the same day, which made me think it was on the day he was murdered. Oh, okay, yeah, I could, I can see how like all those puzzle pieces are kind of fitting together, where Gomez just just murdered Fester in the back or something. Yeah, but honestly, now, I guess they just do a seance every Christmas? Uh, I don't believe that was during Christmas. Yeah, I think that was like a time skip. Yeah, I suppose. I don't know. the. Yeah, there weren't really dates in this much at well, all, actually. Well, it, it's, uh, it starts on Christmas and ends on Halloween, the movie. Oh, that's right. That's right. I forgot to end on Halloween. Which, um, like, back in the 90s, that was always kind of reversed. Where it's you start on uh you start on like Halloween or some uh, holiday like that and you end on Christmas. Well, yeah, you have to have the big family moment on Christmas. Yeah, and I just like that uh kind of juxtaposition where the big family moment is during Halloween. <laughs> but so the Adams family are just these just rich, rich weirdos. Um, yeah, very weird, very rich. And. They have very little contact with their community, with the exception of Gomez um, repeatedly destroying the window of his neighbor with golf ball. His neighbor also happens to be a local county judge. Yep. Which makes me very confused at how he hasn't had any legal action taken against him up until this point. Yes, um, also considering how bad their lawyer is. Yeah, and the other character, I, Kevin, I do not remember the lawyer's name at all. Uh, I believe it's Tully. Okay, so Tully and Tully's wife um, are kind of minor characters, and they are the ones who um, are sort of the catalyst for the plot. Uh, basically, Tully's in a very large amount of debt. Yeah, to, uh, I believe, a Miss Craven, who is a, wow, just a very creative name. Yes, um, 100. Beautiful am. I mean, at least you know who the villain of the story is. I, I don't know if I can call her a villain when casual murder happens so often. Um, I, I would say there's no good people in this movie, really. True. Very true. I, but, maybe Cousin It, but then again, they, they commit like, uh, well, I don't know if it's infidelity, but there's like mentions of that. <laughs> Uh, I mean, their marriage is on the rocks anyways. Like, it was very clearly ending. I, I, I guess. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna, I, I didn't judge her too much for that one. Um, eh. um, but yes, Miss Craven and their lawyer make this plot to find the Adams Family Vault. And yes. They do this by um, just coincidence. Um, Craven has a adopted son yes adopted son named gordon or gordy yeah oh man what an awful name gordy oh you know who else was named uh have you ever heard of the movie uh freddie got fingered yes but i don't know anything about it okay uh tom green's character is named like gordy all right kevin next time you loot a blockbuster make sure to pick up one I yeah, uh, I, I have to see if they have, like, the green casing. Because they also have, like, the VHS where it was, like, a, I think a green case or something. For, all, like, a Tom Green film. I have to check that out. Um, but, anyway, sorry. Go on. No, no. But they have this plot for Gordy to infiltrate the Adams Family house as Fester. Because he just looks like him. And it just gets weirder and weirder from there. So, the... Um, Miss Craven um, pretends to be some sort of German psychologist who found um, Fester Gordy. Yeah, and has been taking care of him for like 25 years. 
yes, I did enough psych tests to find out that, yes, he is, in fact, an Adams. Yep. And he tries to infiltrate the Adams family, which, God, is a difficult prospect because things like I slept well are suspicious. I mean, uh, it, it also helps out that uh, Gordon, or Gordy, uh, is a terrible person. So he, he has, like, a suitcase full of, like, bear traps, um, has, a, like, uh, chainsaws, like, a bunch of suspicious stuff that I guess is not suspicious to the Adams family. <laughs> yeah, well, um, oh, yes. Um, what was the, um, Morticia was her name? Yes, um, that's the wife, yes. Yes, the, um, strange femme fatale of the movie. Um, just goes through his stuff and picks up a vial of cyanide and says, as if we'd ever run out. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of my favorite parts, I love that. Yes, um, she's immediately somewhat suspicious of him. As yes. are the children. Um, but honestly, he gets on better than expected. Um, for some reason, Gomez immediately wants to take him to their, like, boy room the next day. And very clearly, Gordon Fester is messing up. He doesn't remember how to get in there. Right, doesn't... he's doing, like, tons of suspicious stuff. Yeah, um, the thing that kind of tip Gomez off the most is when they're in not their wealth vault, which is giant and full of doubloons for some reason. Um, yeah. I, uh, I have many questions, but... As you do. Yeah, I, there are no answers to this. Um, <laughs> you know, they... Gomez basically gives him a noogie and you know gets him in a chokehold and asks him to give him the password to get out. And he doesn't know it. Like, there's no way Gordon would know that. Right, and right. This immediately makes Gomez sort of suspicious because he's like, you've said this to each other 30 times a day. How have you forgotten? Now, right, right. So the, it's starting to unravel just a little bit, and then Gordy's getting a little, uh, getting a little flustered. Yeah, so as he gets more flustered, interesting enough, he kind of gets more into character. Yeah, because like uh, <laughs> basically, yeah, they're it's it's really it's it's really kind of weird. Like the the worse he does, the better he off, I guess he is. Yeah, I mean, at first he's kind of just scared of the food, but after a while he just doesn't care. Yeah, uh, he's getting like acclimated. Yeah, um, yeah, he starts getting attached to the uh, children. Oh, Kevin, what is the daughter's name again? Uh, Wednesday. Wednesday. Um, should have known that just because I listened to a band that's named after her. Um, huh. Wednesday 13. They're kind of a hard rock band. Um, but like, she's asking him to help her school project. He initially said no, but then he decides to help. Like, he's going on and on, and he's becoming more and more an Adams. But his mother is also pushing on him more and more to figure out how to break in already. Right, right. So you have that sort of like a ticking, what, what's a ticking clock kind of element there. They're getting more yeah. suspicious, and then he's trying to fit in, and then he gets like happy about like trying to be part of the family, and yeah. Yeah, teaches the kids how to make explosives and everything. Um, helps them dig mines, I think. It was very strange what he did, but he's very clearly having some, you know, uncle, ch uh, nephew, spawning time. Fun fact, uh, collectively, uh, nieces and nephews are called Niplings. Niplings? Niplings. That is... So, wow, okay. Yeah, so he's just enjoying time with his Niplings. <laughs> um, uh, and... Uh, okay. <laughs> Eventually, uh, I might be skipping over some parts, but the main bit is uh, now that he's kind of convinced them that he is, in fact, the older brother through, you know, acting a little bit better. Um, yeah. His, uh, he's forced by his mother, still in the guise of the German psychologist, um, to take over the family estate. And Ken, he's the eldest brother. He It was left to him in lack of a will, blah, blah, blah. 
and just the mix the Adams family. Yes. Uh, uh, so along with that too is uh, Wednesday discovers that uh, uh, he's not really Fester, or he's pretending. Well, he's not really Fester. Yeah, and I that, forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Kevin. There's so much that uh, uh, we'll get into a little bit, but there's honestly just one thing about this movie that has burned into my brain forever. I I know. We'll we'll get there. We'll get there. And I've honestly, I've got it ready. The rest of it is just a blur in comparison. Like honestly. I was not expecting the credits of the movie to be the highlight. Isn't the right word, but it's the most I can get to. Uh, I, I would say it's like the black light of the film. <laughs> I, I would say it's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would say like, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get there eventually, but like, uh, just, uh, just to summarize, uh, uh, just like a little bit more, um, they kick out the Adams family. Uh, so they can search like the vault with no problems whatsoever, and you yeah. have a few wonderful scenes of uh, Morticia trying to acclimate. So is uh, Gomez and like the rest of the kids. Um, one of uh, my favorite scenes is probably the lemonade stand. If you want to go through that really quick. Oh yes. Okay. So a Girl Scout comes up to them, uh, and she is very persnickety about her lemonade. She wants organic, all natural ingredients. And Wednesday is agreeing with all of them. Oh, yes, of course, of course, they're doing, uh, they're made of these. I mean, not like happily, like, yes, yes, they are. Okay, I understand. And then the Girl Scout, after asking a million times if the lemonade is made with real lemons and real sugar, says she'll make a deal. If she, she buys some lemonade, will they buy some Girl Scout cookies? And Wednesday's only question is, well, are they made with real Girl Scouts? And I believe you called her the smartest character in the whole entire movie, because what does she do after that? She leaves and never comes back. Smartest character in the movie. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, at that moment, like, she she doesn't run, because that shows fear, and very clearly you're in a predatory situation here. But uh, she... you, you, know what's, uh, you know what's funny, though? Uh, she's in the second movie, uh, Adam's, like, Family Values. And she gets burned at the stake. Wait, what? Yeah, that girl, the Girl Scout, gets burned at the stake in the second film. Okay. We still have to watch the second one. Kevin, <laughs> uh, uh, let me one second. Let me. Oh my god! <laughs> okay, anyways, then I got that on my system. Um, ah, uh, something to look forward to, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm more flummoxed now. I don't like this. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, anyway, anyway. Um, but, uh, they, uh, they get a court battle, they lose it, so the the property is definitely there. They're acclimating poorly. However, uh, Kevin, please correct me if I'm wrong from this. Uh, Fester starts getting his memories back. I I would say like uh Fester, well Gordon or Fester, like whatever you want to call him. Uh, let's just say Fester. Um, he starts getting more and more like aggravated at uh his quote unquote mother. So. Like, they keep on failing, and then he looks like he's depressed. He's trying to eat that soup, and then, like, uh, he misses the Adams family. I don't know if he's necessarily getting his memories back, or he's just like, wow, my mom is the worst. <laughs> I mean, his mother is still better than the Adams family, but yes, is normally the worst. Um, that's I'd say that's debatable. Yeah, but eventually, he sort of, uh, you know, invites the Adams family back in, um, and they kind of have a romp where they. Does he murder his mother, or does she just get kicked out? Um. So I believe his mother is dead. Uh. There's a there's a final confrontation. Uh. Morticia. She goes to uh the Adams family estate. Uh. To. Oh, that's right. That's right. Sorry. Once yeah. again, Kevin. I'm still. My brain is still scrambled by the credits. That's that's fair. Um. So she goes uh to the estate to confront Fester because her family is literally falling apart. Um. As that's going on, they try to interrogate her and torture her, which she likes a lot, apparently. 
Oh, that's right. Oh, my God. I even made the comment, yes, this is just what she does on Tuesdays, though. Yes. <laughs> um, where they tied her down to, like, a... a, a the wheel. Yeah, well, what do you call that? Where it's like they pull like the limbs apart, basically. I don't actually know. I, I, I thought it was rod and quarter, but I think that involves horses. That that involves horses, but there's like a uh, there's just like a machine that does that. I don't know what it's called, or if even that's like real, or maybe it's just like made up. But I don't yeah, know. I mean, I've also heard reports that there's no such thing as a historic Iron Maiden. So at this point, I think it's all just rumor. Like, yeah, it's it's all up in the air. Um. Uh, but yeah, Gomez comes to rescue. Uh, for some reason, the lawyer decides fencing the fencing master would be a good idea. And then I would say the second smartest character uh, does a really smart move and pulls out a gun. Can I just say I'm surprised it took that long for anyone to bring out a gun? Um, that was uh, Miss Craven, correct? Yes, Miss Craven pulling out a gun, yes. Yeah, I, look, I, I'm just saying... I'm surprised there weren't more guns in this movie. I understand it's the 90s, and that's when they just started putting guns off movies and everything. Yeah, they got a little bit more conscious of that. But, I mean, there's still enough smoking where it kind of surprised me that it was, like, kind of puritanical about guns. I mean, yeah, a lot of smoking cigars. I mean, if, if they didn't have that, I feel like it wouldn't be... It's just part of his character. He smokes cigars. It's like a literal character thing he has. All right, Kevin, so tell me what happens when she pulls out the gun. My brain's still in the credits. Okay, so after uh, she pulls out the gun, um, Fester and him, uh, there's like this bookcase that leads down to the vault. There's a specific book that you pull, uh, Greed, to get to the vault. Fester pulls a quick one, um, changes his heart when uh, his mother insults him in his manhood and says, like, he's worthless. Uh, and from there, uh, Fester grabs a book with a literal hurricane. I think it was like Hurricane Irene. Yes, that's it. I don't, yeah. I don't know if that's historic or not, but... But it's there. Um, so the uh, she pulls out the book um, and causes a hurricane to happen and uh, basically kills both the lawyer and his uh, fake mother. Yeah, they both go directly into graves that were prepped by Wednesday. Her brother asks... Are they dead yet? And she responds, does it matter? <laughs> and, and they just look at each other and just nod, and they bury them alive, probably. Yeah, once again, all the murders happen technically off screen. Technically, yes. Ah, fantastic. Um, yep, and yeah, from there, um, you find out that Fester was actually Fester the whole entire time, and he was just confused from the Bermuda Triangle, which they bring up some good amount of times in the uh, film itself. Yeah, um, no, I've actually been to Bermuda and went straight through the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, and how did you uh, survive? Uh, shockingly well. I mean, nowadays, you know, I wouldn't go through there, Cthulhu and all, but... Um, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, at the time, I actually asked one of the guys on the cruise line that worked there, and he's like, yeah, the reason there's so many dead people there are because there's so many ships that go through there. Oh. <laughs> like, it's just a real hot spot for travel. Okay, so more about volume than scariness, I suppose. Yeah, it's, it's just it's like, a, I mean, it's like going through a really crowded highway that's just under, like, constant traffic jams. Like, right. you don't get them constantly, but it's still crowded enough where it's almost there. Accidents yeah. are going to happen all the time. Well, do you know what the uh, deadliest house in, uh, sorry, deadliest room in your house is? Uh, it's gotta be probably my kitchen. Ah, uh, bathroom. That was my second guess. Um, let me guess, people slip out of the shower a lot? Yeah, people slip out of the shower and bang their heads and then just die horribly. Or you get stabbed in the shower like Psycho. Which, by the way, have you seen Psycho? Several Psychos. Nice, okay. Not, uh, <laughs> not the movie, just several Psychos outside. I can see yeah. one, like, looking in through my window right now. Kevin, throw your French bulldog at it. Uh, do you mean the spider one, or do you mean the normal one? Uh, the normal one, stew. Oh, stew? Oh, the tank. Yeah, you're right. Okay, one sec. Okay, that's good. Stew, you there, boy? Uh, not anymore. Oh. Okay, so let's not dwell on that. Um, anyways, then they have a wonderful Adams Family um, Halloween get-together. 
Fester uh, goes into his old self, and they all live happily ever after? Um, yeah, I would say as happy as a bunch of weirdos could be, yeah. Yeah, okay. And then Kevin, then comes, look, I, I'm not gonna lie, I probably should have watched the movie again, Kevin, I'll admit this. Yeah. However, I have listened to the end credit song maybe a hundred times the last, it has haunted my dreams, I've been humming it constantly. Um, now, uh, it's called The Adam's Group, and it's by MC Mi Hammer. Yeah, Mr. MC people. Hammer, yes. Which, by the way, it, it says in the credits, it's just Hammer, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, I, I thought that was interesting, too. I thought he always went by, like, MC Hammer. Yeah. yeah, well, I think you thought briefly, and I can't blame you for this, that it couldn't possibly have been MC Hammer. It had to just be someone else that just had Hammer as their name. Yeah, like, just somebody that was like, oh, MC Hammer is taken. I'll just do Hammer, and then I'll sound pretty cool, I guess. But no, it's MC Hammer. Yeah, and it's, oh, okay, this song is so weird. It's sort of an early 90s corporate rap, like, hip-hop thing. Like, it, you know, it's very of its time sort of thing. The rap is cool. We're trying to get a market that probably doesn't really exist. Yeah, I, uh, uh so I have the lyrics right here. Um, do you want to sing the lyrics really quick? Uh, sure, Kevin. Um, either send me the lyrics or I will go through my center library and find them. All right, uh, go through the library really quick. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, we'll do it, we'll do it like this. Uh, <laughs> I'll sing a line and then you sing a line and then we'll just go off, off, and off. Okay, we can't sing all of it, Kevin. Look, it is a four minute song. It is it is a four minute song. Let's just go with the uh uh let's just go with uh I don't know. But let's let's start and see where it feels right to end. Yeah, okay. That sounds fine to me. Alright. Kevin, um you, this is your idea. You have to set the tone on this one. Please start singing for me. Okay. Uh opening on uh a graveyard, uh, and then you get a wonderful looking MC hammer. And we start off with, they do what they want to do, say what they want to say. Live how they want to live, play how they want to play. Dance how they want to dance, kick and slap a friend. The Adams Family. Now I was cold cooling, you know, maxing and relaxing. Just kicking around the house, Oak Town kicking it. <laughs> and a knock, a knock, and a knock voice. Yo! Can Hammer come out? What's, What's up? <laughs> now I don't mind being a friend. And showing a little bit of flavor. Flavor. But Wednesday, Pugsley, go Master Fester. Oh, man. Man, those are some strange neighbors. I... They do what they want to do. Say what they want to say. <laughs> live how they want to live. Play how they want to play. Dance how they want to dance. Kick and slap a friend. Yeah, I'm <laughs> stop. <laughs> okay, stop. I can't do any more of this. All right, look. This yeah. is, I just want to point out, the music video for this had to watch it afterwards it was it apparently was showed before the movie in theatrical ver release yes yes and it, it like mc hammer gets beheaded very early on yeah and his head's just is just is cgi flopping around everywhere it, yeah it's like mostly clips from the movie and then some mc hammer style dances yeah, and MC MC Hammer is also macking on um, Morticia, like Gomez's uh, wife. I feel like Gomez is into that. Uh, well, they do fence each other in the music video. Yeah, they're, they're, he fences everybody though. Um, True. But it, it's so weird, and just the chorus is interesting. I mean, the first bit just you know they do what they want to do, say what they want to say. That's fine. Dance how they want to dance. Kick and slap a friend. The Adams family. Yeah. It, okay. That line, it doesn't, it, like the other lines, it ends with say, play, and then friend. Like it's made to be jarring. I mean, like, uh, can, can we all, I mean, okay. Not, I'm uh, not, never really been a big fan of MC Hammer. And, uh, I, I don't think he put too much effort into this. <laughs> yeah. Wait, well, let me, uh, go back to a later, uh, later bit of the song. Too legit, Adams. Too legit, Adams. Too legit. Who's too legit? The Adams family. Mm, yeah. You know what I'm saying? The Adams. Adams. Too legit. Oh, yeah. Adams. Too legit. Talking about the Adams now. Adams. Too legit. I'm saying.
saying it's the Adams now, the Adams family. Yo, yeah. take it to the bridge. Thank you, Fester. <laughs> I know, like he says, thank you, Fester, in a different tone, and kind of would clear up the music. Yeah, but uh, there's only so many two legits you can have. I mean, in it, song, let alone yeah, more in a row before it gets a bit repetitive. I mean, it's too legit, Kevin. It's too legit. It's well, it's it's too repetitive. Too repetitive, Ted. <laughs> I, it's 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 a it's a it's an interesting beast. This song. I, I'm. I, how much I cannot find the answer. I want to know how much MC Hammer was paid for this. Uh, okay. Do you want to? Okay. Do you want to? Uh, I'm gonna say like a guess, and this is let's keep in mind like 1990s money. Yeah. So about so with inflation, um, a 1991 dollar is a little bit more than twice the current dollar value. All right. How many Doge coins does that equal? Mike and Doge coins is actually the harder question. That is hard. I'm sorry. Yeah, I shouldn't put you on the spot like that. Uh, yeah. Um, normally I would know. Um, how much a Doge coin costs, but um, it's obviously because of TikTok. It's apparently, um, actually, it's it's significantly up in the price. Okay, so a Doge coin, uh, a Doge coin right now is worth zero point. Zero zero two six five six five seven dollars. Okay. <laughs> so it's worth just a little bit more than a quarter of a penny. Okay, that's some saving right there. Uh so okay. What what is your what is your general guess here for how much MC Hammer got paid to write this uh miracle of a song? All right, I know less about the music industry than I know about music. Fair. Uh, did, I, did I say it wrong? I know less about the music than I know about music, which is saying something. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't. Well, Kevin, do you know the budget for this movie? Um, I can look that up really quick. Uh, let me start up the generator and ba 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 ba. I mean, it. Yeah, I mean, it can't be that much. I would think. Uh, forty million. If I had to guess, you'd say forty million. Not, not for the song, for the movie budget. Well, I would hope the song's not worth forty million. <laughs> That'd be like insane, man. I, okay, look, I, I'm thinking like it's got to be at least a million dollars, though. A million? Like, you're saying a million dollars for the song? Look, I'm just saying, just like distribution and all the rights and everything. I'm, it's I don't know. I'm saying, I, I'm thinking a million. Uh, 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 I don't know. I, I, I would say like 10,000 or something. Like, I, I you, you're saying like a million dollars to just like make it. I, that can't be right. Uh, I, 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 I would really hope not. Kevin, if you ever find the answer, let me know. If, if I ever do, I'll, I'll be like the first one to tell you. Yeah, I'm expecting a phone call in the middle of the night. Okay. Uh, let me see. Let me see. But no, if anyone, just anyone who wants just their life to be changed irreparably, don't watch the movie. It's a fine movie, you know. It's a good uh, movie. Yeah, I would have to give it, I don't know, eight radioactive Prince Bulldog spiders out of 11, but... Oh, eight out of 11. I was going to guess that you were going to put like uh, five or six. No, no, I, I'd watch it again. Uh, 100% think it's worth, I mean... I am, for one, really for, now that the sort of culture has ended, um, you know, kind of preserving that as much as possible. I mean, there is sort of progress in all things. Um, right. And I, I think it'd be bad to lose. And not only that, I feel like this is a time capsule for a certain point. I feel like there's a sort of undercoat in culture. I mean, we can kind of talk about the goth music and everything later on, that this sort of earlier. I mean, there's always sort of been that drive there underlined for a while. Uh, I'm just... It's just something that I would enjoy watching. I mean, the first time I think I was more shocked than anything about how different it was than I expected. Right. But it's not a bad movie. I mean, I'd watch the sequel right now if I had that. Least. I mean, uh, I, I, I personally, I love this movie. 
It's a uh, oh, the budget was thirty million. The movie or the song? Uh, just the just the movie was thirty million, and you're saying one million of that budget went to MC Hammer to produce that masterpiece of a song. And the music video. And okay, you know what? Music video. I did not think of that. Maybe that's getting up there now. So, you know what? I'll I'll uh I'll take back what I said earlier. I'm gonna say fifty thousand. Yeah, I, I, well, I mean, most of this movie must have went towards effects. Yeah, and the box office was one hundred ninety one million. Oh wow! So, this, good success. Yeah, this. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I I don't know anyone who saw this in theaters, but also I was negative one when this was in theaters. No, same here. Uh, man, that's so strange. Uh, I never thought it'd be that much of a hit. Okay, you know what? Okay, I have an idea. We, it won't give us an exact um, um, but I wonder if we can find the sales figures for the album that Adam Drew, the wonderful song of MC Hammer's, made. That'd just be interesting. That would be interesting. <laughs> All right, but let's save that for next time, my friend. All right, Kevin. All right. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening um, to Downtime and the Apocalypse, uh, where Ted talks and Kevin listens. Uh, Ted? It's yep. That's Kevin. Yes. <laughs> oh. Don't get confused that he was the one talking during this. Yes, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. We want to make sure that's pretty solid. Um, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, next week after hopefully we survive the horde um what well, what's your plan to survive the horde ted same thing as it is always join them oh okay I, uh, look look whether or not blockers or raiders if you just put enough bloody clothes on you can just you can just join them walk by them none of them know each other's names most of them don't even care anymore if you just look like you belong you belong so so you're kind of telling me fake it till you make it Always fake it till you make it. Look, whether or not it's a career move, being happy, um, if you're Pascal being religious, or being a um, raider um, going through the fortified Dunkin' Donuts, um, which is now considered a freehold of the Empire, uh, burning it down and uh, ripping open the people for the delicious donuts inside, you just have to fake it till you make it, man. If you act the part, you'll eventually be the part. Yeah, you know what? Uh, and that's what we have to leave off with you today, uh, listeners, is fake it till you make it. And I would say, yeah, keep to that advice right there. Um, also, uh, jelly filled, uh, it's not the type of jelly you want. That's what. Uh, that's all I'll say about that. But it's the type of jelly you need. It's the type of jelly you deserve. Definitely not last one. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Have a solid, solid day, and we'll see you next time.